Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Gala Dinner. My name is, oh, thank you, thank you. It's huge, it's huge. My name is Lian Hang Nguyen, and I'm the director of the Institute and your MC for the evening. So you're gonna hear a lot from me and I'm gonna yell at you a lot. No, I won't, I'll be, I'll be perfectly pleasant. It's a privilege to be here surrounded by such esteemed honorees and guests celebrating this landmark achievement. And it is thanks to your support that we have made it to where we are today. In particular, I want to recognize our lead sponsors who have made this evening possible. Our gala chair, Chin Chu, and CC Capital. Chin, I won't make you stand up. Uh, but Chin probably doesn't know this, uh, but he's become my mentor. Now you would think I would ask him advice, you know, his opinions on, on financial matters, but no, 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 no. Instead, I ask his opinion on more important things like, Chin, are the Eagles gonna make it to the Super Bowl this year? Or Chin, what's the best sushi joint in town? Now, I think I'm probably not tapping into his full potential as mentor, but I am able to keep my vow of poverty as an academic. And thank you, Madam Tuile from Vin Group, Vin Fast, uh, for sponsoring the leadership table. You know, Tui's generosity really knows no bounds. Last year, she allowed me and several of my siblings to stay in her lovely home in Hanoi. But what Tui doesn't know is I'm the youngest of nine, so there are more siblings to come. So let's get the beds ready this summer. Okay. So what brings us all together tonight? For those of you who caught our promotional video, it was good, right? For at least those of you who weren't drinking too much and you know <laughs> could hear. Um, I think it was really good. I think it was award-winning level. And since we have Dawn Hudson, former head of the Academy of Motion Pictures and Arts and Sciences here with us, she can award us an Oscar. Um, Dawn, thank you. All right, Weatherhead, we got one of those golden statues that she probably carries around everywhere she goes. Thank you. This Oscars level video captured what the Weatherhead East Asian Institute does. We are the preeminent center for the interdisciplinary study of modern East Asia. And tonight is a celebration of the Institute in the decades since we were founded in 1949. Over the last 75 years, we've evolved since our initial focus on J Japan's transformation from enemy to friend, and when challenges were presented in the establishment of the People's Republic of China. We grew to encompass the study of North and South Korea, and we took on the study of Tibet and Mongolia. All the while, our faculty grew to encompass schools throughout the university as we studied and taught about America's engagement with East Asia. Now, my path to academia in many ways parallels the history of the Institute. I am a product of the Cold War, and my journey to America was a direct result of the dearth of knowledge about Asia and the United States at the time. My family fled Saigon on April 30th, 1975, and I've devoted my academic career to understanding that devastating war and to building bridges between the land of my birth and my adopted country to promote peace in the region. But in my journey as a Vietnam War scholar, I was lucky enough to meet one man by the name of Mr. Tommy Vallely, who I call General. And he has taught me more about that conflict from our many conversations than any book I've ever read. General, thank you. And uh, when are you gonna come back and guest lecture my class? They're all waiting for you. There's the Dorothy Borg Chair in the History of American East Asian Relations, a position named after an esteemed scholar at Weatherhead, an award-winning historian, and stalwart opponent of McCarthy's Red Scare. I gratefully stand on the shoulders of past directors, many of whom are here with us tonight, as we navigate new challenges and undertake new initiatives at the Institute. This includes our Asian Action Program, which supports innovators and practitioners and collaborative work that bridges scholarly research with artistic endeavors, activism, and high impact projects. It is through this initiative that we welcome Tony Bui this past fall as our filmmaker in residence.
Tony's award-winning film, Three Seasons, was just re-released at the recent Sundance Film Festival, and he's currently working on a feature-length film on the Napalm Girl photo while at the Institute. With your support, we look forward to bringing many more wonderful Asian Action Fellows to the Institute in the years to come. We are also excited about expanding two new areas of expertise as we look to the next 75 years, climate change in East Asia to raise awareness, promote research, and put forward solutions about the most important geopolitical crisis facing our planet, and Global Asia, where we address issues confronting Asian populations in the region, in the United States, and across the globe in an era of rising anti-Asian hate, the proliferation of mental health issues, and challenges posed by artificial intelligence in an increasingly globalized world. But about the program tonight, the honorees joining us at the gala and the students they recognize are incredible individuals with accomplishments that the Institute has long supported, the fields of policy, art, literature, business, philanthropy, journalism, and activism. The richness they add to our community and their influence on their fields is an inspiration. And I cannot wait for you to meet them all this evening. And as with all great events, this gala took a village, a Mekong-sized village at that, to pull off. I want to thank my husband, Professor Paul T. Chamberlain, who's working and finishing up his book on World War II. As I've become more of an event planner, and my staff, which has truly become my work family. They include Catherine Forche, Executive Director, Sarah Jessup, Assistant Director, Nancy Hershon, Finance Director, Susie Lin Shu, Wilson Ariana, Julie Lin King, Ratna, and especially Hiba Rashid. She's our most recent hire, and we threw the most work on her. Sorry, Hiba. And now we are especially pleased to honor U.S. Presidential Envoy for Climate and former Secretary of State, John Kerry. Just as our institute was founded with the mission to inform policymakers and policy concerning Asia 75 years ago, Secretary's, Secretary Kerry's focus on climate represents the same call for action for the 21st century. A discussion of climate, energy, and environmental issues is not complete without acknowledging the importance of Asia and U.S. cooperation with Asia, while sec which sec Secretary Kerry has long understood. Coupled with his extensive personal history in the region as a Vietnam veteran, former Secretary of State, and more recently as a supporter of Fulbright University of Vietnam, he is the natural choice to speak before our group this evening. Special Envoy Kerry, Tommy says I can call you John. I also need to thank you personally for two reasons. First, thank you for having me over to your home to screen the greatest beer run ever with producer Andrew Moscato, who I think is here in the audience. Hi, Andrew. Um, and second, well, actually, maybe next time we can screen Tony's film when he finishes it. So, on the date? All right. And second, uh, the reason I want to thank you is for speaking out in 1971. When I show your testimony in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in my classes, I've never seen my students more riveted and inspired. And now I would like to introduce President Manoush Shafiq the 20th president of Columbia University. Dr. Shafiq built her career as an economist at the World Bank where she rose to the rank of vice president before departing for the British government's Department for International Development and eventually the IMF and the Bank of England. She has spent decades of work in the economics of climate change and exploring a green industrial revolution. She came to Columbia after previously serving as a director of the London School of Economics and we warmly welcome her to campus and to New York and to our gala tonight. President Shafiq, we hope to see you at many more Institute events. And one more thing, President Shafiq, I have personally been looking forward to having the first woman president and the first president of color at Columbia University. We are so glad you are here. Thank you, President Manu Shafiq, my president. It is a complete delight to be here this evening to celebrate the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, to congratulate our honorees and introduce our extraordinary keynote speaker. To Len Hangwen, thank you for your masterful leadership of the Institute and congratulations on reaching this milestone. <laughs> to the recipients of the 75th Anniversary Awards for Excellence, thank you for your work, for your talent, and for the example that you set in the lives you have lived. To Secretary Kerry, an honoree and tonight's speaker, thank you for coming, thank you for your leadership, and thank you for your service. 
I know we're all eager to hear what you have to say. So with that in mind, my introduction will be brief. The Weatherhead East Asian Institute represents the very best of Colombia, an academic hub founded three quarters of a century ago to address gaps in this nation's understanding of a region of critical global importance and how prescient they were. Today, the Institute is the university's premier center for East Asian studies. Its members excel in their charge to train future generations of leaders and engage with people, institutions, and issues shaping the region and the world. It stretches across schools and departments with experts in everything from history, politics, law, business, architecture, and urban planning. And I should be encouraging you to eat, so please eat. <laughs> and I will happily talk through the forks and plates. Um, but it is this reputation for interdisciplinary excellence that has brought us all here tonight, especially our honorees and our speaker. Now, Secretary Kerry needs very little introduction, but he's gonna get one anyway from me. To reflect on his career is to appreciate the skill, the determination, and the integrity with which he has lived his remarkable life. He's a rare thing these days, a dedicated politician led by principles that have shaped his career. He's been a decorated combat veteran, a giant of the United States Senate, the Democratic Party's nominee for president in 2004, the 68th Secretary of State, and most recently, President Biden's special envoy for climate. And in all those roles, he's worked on national security issues, nuclear nonproliferation, international drug trafficking, global money laundering, humanitarian aid, and war crimes in Cambodia, among many other issues. And he's also distinguished himself as an advocate for vulnerable groups, including veterans, soldiers missing in action, and victims of HIV. His latest role brought his focus squarely on climate, a long-held passion partly ignited by our own Jim Hansen's testimony to a Senate Committee on Global Warming, a term invented here at Columbia University. He was a force of nature working on behalf of nature. As special envoy for climate, he managed the nation's reentry to the Paris Agreement, which he signed at the UN headquarters with his two-year-old granddaughter on his lap. He led us through three UN climate summits and received widespread admiration for his handling of US relations with China. And he's here tonight to be honored for this work and for his longstanding and deeply felt ties to the people, the history, and the institutions of East Asia. As Director Nguyen had mentioned earlier, the Secretary recently announced that he will step down from his role in the Biden administration in the spring. And while that news is bittersweet, I must say I can't wait to see what he does next. And with that, please join me now in welcoming Secretary John Kerry to the podium. Shafiq, thank you very, very much for an extraordinarily generous introduction, and let me just say to you, I have never met a person in public life who doesn't want and need an introduction. So uh, I was fearful that at first you were just going to, you know, kind of throw it away and I'd slide up here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've got a lot of power here because I'm all that stands between you and the next course. So I'm going to try to respect that, but I also do have some things I want to share with you. You know, when people do an introduction like that, um, if you're the person being introduced, you kind of try to find a way, is there some in, is there something where you can rib them a little bit or, you know, make light of it. But she left me no opening. Uh, so I can't do that, but I'll share with you. I want to share with you a true story. It's one I love. And politics is full of, as Chris Matthews know, knows who's here, He's one, of, he's one of the great storytellers. Mike Barnacle is here. He's one of the great storytellers. Um, back in the day when there was no TV and radio and so forth, uh, people would be on the circuit, you know, the Chautauqua circuit, and they were speaking, and, and, and that's how you gained a reputation. So one night, Chauncey Depew, a senator from New York, was chosen to introduce William Howard Taft 
at this huge dinner with a long day or something, the you know, top of it. And um, and Chauncey gets up there and man, he is not gonna lose this opportunity to make a reputation for himself. So he gets completely wound up and he's looking down. And by then, ladies and gentlemen, William Howard Taft was a man of considerable girth. I mean, <laughs> serious. So Chauncey is going on, ladies and gentlemen, we have here with us the President of the United States, such an exalted position. Let me just point him out to you sitting there, pregnant with hope, pregnant with courage. And so, you know, Taft sort of looks quizzically at him and, and he gets up and he purposefully walks up kind of slow, rubbing his tummy, looking his quite big tummy, looking at everybody and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. If it is to be a girl, we will call her Hope. And if it is to be a boy, we will call him Courage. But if, as I suspect, it is merely gas, we will call it Chauncey Depew. Um, you gotta take your shots when you, when you get them. Um, I know you'll forgive me for doing that. I turned 80 the other day, uh, which is... <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's an experience. <laughs> Better to be experienced than not. But um, I want to assure all of you here, I can do all the things at age 80 that I did when I was 50. I just can't remember what they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm stopping now. I'm <laughs> not going to get into more trouble. Genuinely, I am really honored to be here for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the Weatherhead Institute itself, uh, Columbia, uh, but also uh, Tom Vallely, uh and those who have uh, worked so hard through the years to try to increase our learning, our ability to understand people. and. Um, you know, 75 years of bringing scholars and public intellectuals together from opposite sides of the planet in order to find common ground that can literally only emerge from hard-earned mutual understanding, of which we all know there is such a paucity today, it's frightening for this great country. And it's easy today in our age of democratized travel, smartphones, Zoom, social media, it's easy to take for granted the modern advances that have made our world so much smaller and the ease with which countries can talk to each other and forge relationships. Relationships, my friends, are the basis of any real understanding between leaders and nations. And regrettably, we have not seen, in my judgment, the ability of countries to be able to find the same ground that we used to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I can actually talk about those decades. You simply can't understand people or the people who define a country. Their motives, their aspirations, their foibles, their, their, their fears. You can't understand them if you haven't taken the time to try to get to know them. So I am an advocate for engagement. I always told my staff in the State Department or in the Senate, let's get caught trying. And I'd rather be caught trying than as Tommy will remember or Bob Kerry who's here, I'd rather be caught trying rather than see a whole generation go to a war that never should have been fought in the worst place. So it's easy today to forget the road that we've traveled. When the Weatherhead was created in 1949, the understanding of relationships did not unfold naturally. In fact, it was a lack of real relationships, a deficit of actual understanding that loomed like an impenetrable fog over the yawning geographic divide between Asia and the United States. The world was emerging from the most turbulent and consequential decade in modern history. 
World War II had given way to a newly reordered world, and it had equally given birth to a new disorder. And on the surface, it seemed as though the United States and the Soviet Union just stood alone in a bipolar world, two superpowers on a collision course. But the temptation to see the world strictly in binary terms was a failure to see the world as it really was, as it always is, heterogeneous, defined by the complex individual aspirations of people everywhere, by their culture, their history, their lives. And across the Ural Mountains, no less impacted by the war than anywhere else, stood China, which had to reorder itself, too. In Japan, post-war reconstruction led the country down a path towards capitalism and democracy across the water. Mao's newly established People's Republic of China marched down the opposite road towards communism and authoritarianism. In Congress, a self-defeating and hollow debate over who lost China accompanied McCarthyism and the Red Scare with little effort to take the time to study China's history let alone wonder whether communism itself might not actually be monolithic. Elsewhere in Asia, the colonial order began to collapse. India, a British territory, had won its independence in 1947. Vietnam forced out the French after Dien Bien Phu in 1954. In Washington, the Dulles brothers assumed Ho Chi Minh was a Soviet surrogate. Never did they wonder whether a revolutionary who had once sought President Wilson's support at Versailles might be a figure to actually engage, not one to ignore. Understanding, curiosity, nuance, appreciation for Asia's immense potential, these were literally all qualities which then had yet to be learned in Washington let alone embraced. Now into these shifting sands stepped the Weatherhead East Asia Institute, as thoughtful an institution as you could imagine in a world where failures of understanding could lead to great failures of history and humanity. Soon, on the battlefields of Southeast Asia, young Americans in uniform, some of my closest friends, lived out the real-world consequences of failures of understanding. Despite the war's untruthful foundation, believe me, a generation fought in the great tradition of America's warriors, and they fought for their families, for their love of country, for love of their brothers in arms, if they could not have fought for the legitimacy of why they were there. I mentioned Tommy Ballaly and Bob Carey, two of my closest friends, two men who spent their lives after the war making peace with Vietnam, the country, and here at home with Vietnam, the consequences. They have never stopped building understanding, and I couldn't be more grateful for the friendship and for the example of their lives well-lived than those exemplified by Tommy Vallely and Bob Carey. Bob Carey who won the Medal of Honor and Tommy who won a Silver Star. And both of them deserve your appreciation here tonight. <laughs> Tommy and Bob and I all share a conviction, earned the hard way, that it's so much better for a generation and for people on both sides if we do the hard work of understanding countries and cultures and civilizations before we send our young men and women to die in wars built on misinformation and misjudgment and miscalculation. And I think no war stands out more poignantly in that score than Iraq. That is why the Weatherhead's work in Asia is so critical, not just to avoid needless conflict, but to know what is really going on and address the battle for next generations. And make no mistake, my friends, that battle is here now. 
Mark Twain wrote, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. Think about that. Today, our rhyme, the climate crisis, is a simultaneous threat to life in every nation and every citizen on this planet. Our rhyme is not a war of one nation against another. It's a war unlike any crisis ever before in human history, where the worst instincts of human behavior fight the best, where indifference, greed, business as usual, disinformation, outright lies, and even ignorance combine to avoid choices that could not be more obvious or more compelling. Think about that. This is not a crisis born out of competing ideology, but my friends, it is nevertheless a crisis of mutually assured destruction. And solving it, which is still within our grasp, barely, but still within our grasp, depends on the actions taken by the very human beings who by choice are creating the crisis in the first place. And yes, there are obstacles standing in our way, some of which bear the scars of colonialism, the divide between developed and developing countries, grudges and grievances between rich and poor nations, and differences on other issues which can and do disrupt needed progress. But bridging those divides, my friends, is the only way to resolve this crisis. Any solution really comes down to one word, politics. It's the biggest mystery that we yet have to solve. We know the climate crisis is the result of one thing. Oh, actually three things, but one major thing. It is principally the result of the burning, the unabated burning of fossil fuel. Also, the problem of deforestation from industry and agriculture, and also the disturbances of already deposited carbon, which occurs because of the way we fish and the way we drag through the ocean and the things we do on the planet. So the solution is equally clear. Decarbonize. But the barriers to following the science and implementing that solution are all political. So how do we accelerate decisive action? Well, we have to organize countries, we have to organize companies, we have to organize ourselves to sustain our own future. Defeating a threat that knows no borders, salutes no flag, sings no anthem, demands that we all get better at what my father, a foreign service officer, taught me was the essence of good diplomacy, seeing other countries and people through their own eyes, not just ours. So we need to take our blinders off. You know what the Chinese saw and felt this last summer? Temperatures that climbed over 125 degrees regularly, floods that wiped out countless numbers of citizens, drought that restrained the growth of crops. In Japan and India, they saw and felt unbearable heat waves. In Vietnam, they felt the impact of extreme drought that strained power supplies, causing rolling blackouts. Nothing provides focus like a crisis you can see with your own eyes and feel in your own community. But even without that, you don't have to be a genius to know what's happening in the Arctic and the Antarctic, that the best scientists in the world tell us now we face five potential tipping points, points beyond which if we go, there is no return. What are those five? The coral reefs, which are dying. The Barents Sea, which has no sea ice in, in, in huge periods of time. The permafrost, which is now thawing around the world and releasing methane, which is 80 to 100 times more destructive than CO2. And finally, the two biggies, Arctic and Antarctic which are melting four times faster than the rest of the planet. My friends, uh, as the crisis has grown, there are signs in Asia now that countries are responding. Japan and Korea are taking critical steps forward to tackle methane emissions from their fossil fuel imports, and they're leading global efforts for clean technologies. Australia passed legislation to slash carbon emissions by 43% by 2030, 
and aims to achieve 82% renewable energy on the grid this decade. But any honest assessment makes clear that this transformation needs to be faster and bigger. That is the only way we win. The key word is accelerate. And if we're going to accelerate decarbonization in Asia's emerging economies, we need to acknowledge that the climate crisis and economic development have now met at a crossroad. There's not a capital in Asia where policymakers aren't asking whether the mitigation required to deal with the crisis is going to restrain economic growth. And the simple answer is, it doesn't have to. But if people think it will, let me tell you, they'll choose the economic growth. Around 2065, the world's youth population is projected to reach its peak at just under 1.4 billion people, the biggest slice of that in Asia. Already rising generations are urbanizing their countries, pouring into the cities, creating unprecedented demand for energy. And through their eyes, the future looks as clear as it might seem contradictory. They know they have to tackle the climate change crisis to build a world worth inheriting, but they won't decarbonize fast enough if they believe it comes at the expense of long sought economic prosperity. That's why this is the golden moment to engage. Because if we are ambitious and creative in shaping partnerships in Asia, decarbonizing or decarbonization can, should, and must become the biggest economic opportunity we've ever known. And believe me, it is bigger than the Industrial Revolution if we really get at it. But right now, we have 2,000 gigawatts of electric power backed up, waiting for permitting at FERC. We can't get permission to transition lines across state lines in the United States. How the hell are you supposed to respond to a crisis that is existential if you're behaving like it's business as usual? So we have to use this crisis as an opportunity for bold cooperation. And the Weatherhead Institute can become a key component of pushing all of your connections, every entity you work with, has to now speak out and speak out louder, clearer, demanding action. The United States has long been part of Asia's growth and part of its growing emissions, therefore. Now we have the opportunity to support its growth through declining emissions and growing clean energy markets. The simple reality is, my friends, the world cannot address the climate crisis without Asia leading the way. And Asia needs the solutions as badly as anyone. Asia's home to over half of the new annual climate emissions, 60% of global GDP, two-thirds of global economic growth, 58% of the world's youth, a staggering 70% of the world's natural disasters, and the largest share of the 7 million people that die around the world every year from air pollution, which is what greenhouse gases are, pollution. The good news is that over the last three years, we did write a new playbook. And I'm proud of what we were able to achieve in these three years with President Biden's leadership. We've developed ambitious decarbonization roadmaps with Vietnam and Indonesia to help them implement their climate commitments under just energy transition partnerships. And these could collectively deliver more than $35 billion of public and private financing to help countries transition. Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, have all demonstrated strong new commitment to tackling the crisis. But the biggest challenge to Asia's transition and what could negate all of our advances elsewhere, hear what I just said, could negate all of our advances elsewhere is a four-letter word, not one I'd like to say, but spelled C-O-A-L, coal. A handful of countries are still building or planning a staggering 500 gigawatts of additional coal power in the 2020s. Almost 80% of it is in China and other Indo-Pacific nations. And current forecasts predict that these build-outs will last for decades, releasing destructive levels of emissions if they are brought online. And what we're arguing with the Chinese now is, you're bringing so much renewable online, you don't have to bring those coal plants online. And our hope and prayer is that they won't have to do that. But it is not certain today. 
Climate dialogue and engagement with China is critical, and I've been fighting for that for the three years I've been in this job. It's not a matter of ideology, folks. It's a matter of simple mathematics. Most countries needed coal to get their economies going, to start them over the last 75 years. But the next 75 years must be very different than the last. And China is the world's second largest economy. It's the largest emitter in the world of greenhouse gases. We are the second, but we're below 10% now. China is at 30%. And you can see that there's no way we get where we need to go without it. So my friends, over 30 years of going to COPs, ministerial, multilateral, I was in Rio at the Earth Conference when George Bush signed the process into law and we started this journey. I have seen again and again that when countries don't want to act, they find excuses in the individual or collective inaction of China and the United States. Conversely, when the United States and China cooperate, it doesn't just erase excuses, it incentivizes ambition elsewhere. U.S.-China climate progress has been critical to aligning the global Rubik's Cube that keeps alive the promise of protecting our entire planet. When President-elect Biden called me about this job in November of 2020, we discussed the world that he was inheriting. Our global standing was at a very low point because President Trump had pulled out of the agreement. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say more. <laughs> Our global standing was at a very low, low point, and uh, President Biden was very, very clear that climate change was one of the core issues that are going to mark the work of his administration, because it truly is existential. So on January 19th, the afternoon before the inauguration, before we even entered the State Department, I sat with our team in a backyard in Washington, and we worked on a roadmap that included restoring climate cooperation with China. Right there, we laid the plans for success, even though some pundits questioned whether it was possible, even worthwhile, and others in the administration didn't want to touch China. They just wanted to isolate it and decouple. So after President Biden reached out to President Xi early on and expressed his hope that climate would be treated as a universal issue, not a bilateral issue, we got on a plane as fast as we could, flew to Shanghai on April 14th with health monitors uh, in moon suits greeting us, swabbing us, pushing us into a bus, taking us to an isolated place. And for four days, we negotiated with our Chinese friends across a 15-foot table. We began restoring the fabric of the climate dialogue. And we were lucky that President Xi had brought the Xi Jinping, my counterpart, who I've known for 25 years, back into government service, and he's a trusted, experienced interlocutor and a personal friend. So less than five months later, we returned to Tianjin, still testing daily and meeting our counterparts at the big table. But those meetings led directly to late night and early morning progress at COP26 in Glasgow. And China then announced with us they would no longer fund foreign coal plants. And since then, despite pauses created by bilateral tensions, work has continued through meticulously scheduled Zooms and teleconferences, a 13-hour time difference. We have pressed on, and this last July, we went to Beijing amid a heat wave during what would become the hottest summer ever on record in China and elsewhere in the world. Before we continued those conversations last November in Sunnylands, California, where with our Chinese counterparts, we spent a week away from the cameras, negotiating on paths for progress. After years of Beijing not accounting for any of its non-CO2 gases, they didn't count methane. Now they will, and they do. Now they have a methane plan. And now we, we know that uh, uh, because of what we were able to accomplish in Sunnylands, uh, we held a summit in Dubai, China and the US hosting a summit on methane which brought 150 or so countries to the table to get something done. So we had the third largest emitter, India, uh, which is on a par with really California's economy almost. We found a breakthrough there. And um, we've been able to cooperate with them. And under the Paris Agreement, we know that uh, we're all going to be now counting our gases the same way and moving in the same direction. Let me just quickly say to you that China, for the first time, stated its anticipation that it's going to achieve net reductions 
of emissions by the end of this decade. That is 20 years ahead of when they had talked previously about doing that. So we are in a different world now with respect to climate. In the years and the months ahead, China and the U.S. will both need to implement commitments. And that's why we established a working group which can significantly advance our progress. And we've already had our first meetings, by the way, and we're looking at things like sustainable development, uh, circular economy, uh, deforestation, methane, et cetera. The simple reality is this. If the two biggest countries don't lead together, few will follow. Simply stated, this collaborative endeavor with China must continue hard fought as it is. And I personally believe there are other areas where we could make progress uh, if we will engage and move that process with a greater intensity. Now, foreign ministers have told me that our, for our breakthrough in California put wind into everybody's sails heading into the COP in Dubai. It put pressure on those who might have pre previously hidden behind China which is what a number of countries unnamed would choose to do. But China's reluctance to embrace a transition away from fossil fuels emboldened other people to resist. Instead, my friends, Dubai, I believe, is going to be judged to be one of the most significant cops in history. The message to investors, the private sector, other actors could not be clearer. The decision in Dubai calls not only for the next set of NDCs, the reduction plans, to be aligned with the 1.5 degrees centigrade, but it also calls for combating deforestation, reducing non-CO2 gases. For the first time ever, almost 200 countries agreed by consensus, which is hard to do when you have 195 countries negotiating, but they agreed by consensus on the imperative of, quote, transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems, accelerating action in this decade, this critical decade, so as to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 in keeping with the science. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a genuine mandate. It doesn't get clearer than that. And our mission now is to go out and move people to do this in the private sector. The COP also operationalized one of the most contentious issues of all, which was what was called a loss and damage fund. And what we have put together is an historic and unprecedented ability to deal with a fund that will deal with climate impact without reference uh, to damages and liability. So now the work to make this all a reality is in everyone's hands. It's in your hands. We all need to engage on this issue because the moment is not just a test of how we help those around the world, uh, it is a test of how we respond at the planet's and humanity's moment of reckoning. I know some are skeptical that in this age of disaggregation and discord, such breakthroughs are possible. I'm an optimist. My life tells me otherwise. My book that I wrote about uh, my life after I was Secretary of State is called Every Day is Extra. And Bob and... and uh, Tommy and Mike and those of us who really grew up with that war understand what that means. 36 years ago this month on the Senate floor, I met a newly sworn in Republican freshman. I was actually senior to him, a rock rib conservative and a fellow Vietnam veteran. We knew we had opposite views about the war in which we'd both served. But we decided one night flying to Kuwait the day after Desert Storm had finished in order to receive the Amir back and thank the troops who had done the Desert Storm. We were sitting opposite each other late at night, midnight, passed, everybody else was asleep. John and I were awake, we talked, John McCain. We talked. We talked about each other's war. We talked about prison versus the rivers in the South. And we decided then to work hand in hand to actually make peace with Vietnam and with ourselves here in America. Because as you recall, Newsweek and others were carrying pictures of troops, of airmen who were downed in North Vietnam and who were alleged to be held in tiger cages and in prisons. So we served together, Bob and I, on the select committee to investigate the fate of Americans still missing in Vietnam. 
We put together the single most exhaustive, complete, uh, detailed tracing of those lost at the moment they were lost, ever conceived of or implemented in the course of human warfare. Even today, there are American soldiers on the ground in Vietnam looking for closure for families here at home. And so we traveled together many times. I stood in John McCain's jail cell with him all alone, and we talked for half an hour. And I'm telling you, if two veterans from the opposite sides of the political fence uh, with the kind of turbulence that both of us had had in the context of Vietnam can find common ground on the concrete floor of a Hanoi prison, we can find common ground here in America anywhere. And that's what we need to work to do. The service and the Senate taught us both that. And, uh, and I believe we will and can come together on the climate issue. America and the world need to come together. That's what politics and diplomacy is supposed to be all about, the politics of possibility, putting dreams into reality. Together from the weatherhead to Washington to Asia, we need to work together, my friends, to see the world through each other's eyes so we can find common ground and see our way to the solutions that we owe our kids, our grandkids, and our country. Thank you. I'm getting more mic time than the MC at the Oscars here. I apologize. Let me, let me try to do this, but I want to do this justice. It's very important. Uh, tonight uh, is also special for a very different reason from the discussion we just had. Uh, and it's special for my friends, uh, Tom Valley and Senator Bob Kerry, because tonight uh, we are joined by our friend Sally Jackson, the wife of my friend and Tommy's friend, Paul Nace. I don't know, Sally, where are you? Somewhere here? Ah, uh, there you are. So when I was first commissioned as a raw ensign, I flew out to California and I was had the hard duty I was stationed on Treasure Island. Um, and Paul Nace was this fellow from Boston, a complete Boston accent and all, who was there with me. We were both assigned to damage control school, which meant we had to learn how to keep a big ship from sinking. And since the Viet Cong didn't have any submarines or any other ships, we wondered what the hell we were doing there every single day. But they'd fill up this thing with water and we'd have to patch it up and, you know, it was really a kind of crazy time. But we got to know each other and laugh a hell of a lot at what we were doing. We also went to Nuclear Chemical Biological Warfare School at the same location. Um, and Paul was a Columbia University School of Business graduate, a lieutenant in the Navy later, an activist when he came home and opposed the war. And in his final years, he was a clean energy innovator. So he lived out, in many ways, what most of us believe is the most important word in the English language, citizen. And that's why I am very proud to announce, together with Tommy uh, and Sally, the Paul F. Nace Jr. Scholarship Fund, which is going to provide financial support to students within the Columbia School of General Studies who are either actively serving or are veterans of the United States military, with special emphasis on those who served in the Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, Irony of ironies, one day I was driving my 50-foot gunboat up a river, not, you know, 20 miles away from Saigon, and I, we were running out of gas, and we weren't too sure where we were going to fill up. So we saw this, and there was enormous uh, uh, military base at Dongtam, the 9th Infantry Division, and we just drove up to an LST that was out there sort of guarding it and providing provisions. And I parked the boat at the dock and started to get off. And I, this Boston voice yelled at me, you can't park your boat there. And I, said, and I looked, and there was Paul Nace, folks, right there in the river at that moment in time. He truly lived out the mission of this institute. He understood that to exist peace, peacefully, uh, to avoid the worst of humanity, which he saw some of, you need a dialogue and an understanding between nations and parts of the world. It's what we just talked about. Paul, uh, politics, Paul loved politics, and he was involved in it all his life. 
he thought it was an honorable profession and should be and could be. Uh, he knew that America was not exceptional just because we beat our chests and say we're exceptional. He knew we're exceptional because we do exceptional things. And this scholarship is gonna give an opportunity to so many more to be able to do extraordinary things just like Paul did. So Tommy, thank you. Bob, thank you. Sally, thank you for helping us remember Paul Nace tonight and sharing a beautiful life with all of us. Thank you all. Hello, everybody. Thank you, thank you for whoever's banging a glass. <clears throat> I hope you're all having a good time. My name is Andy Nathan. I'm a professor of political science at Columbia, and I'm one of the people who uh, thrives under the directorship of Hang. Um, somebody asked us, uh, me and my colleagues, how often do you do these anniversary galas? Do you do it every year or every 25 years? And the answer is that this is the first time we've ever done it. And the reason for that is that no previous director, and I'm one of the previous directors, has the capability to do what Hang has done to convene this tremendous event. So we're now transitioning to the honoree section of the program where we will acknowledge distinguished individuals in the fields of politics, business, journalism, human rights, arts, and culture. These remarkable individuals have significantly contributed to our understanding of East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Inner Asia, which we work on at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. And in addition to these distinguished individuals, we want to recognize some of our students because I think listening to Secretary Kerry's remarks that uh, what we contribute perhaps most importantly to these great world problems is uh, training our wonderful students who go out and accomplish so much. Uh, we want to recognize uh, some of the students with the 75th Anniversary Award for Excellence uh, in honor of the uh, grown-up awardees, as you were, as it was uh, the, in the same disciplines. So our first honoree is Secretary Kerry again. He has to come back to the platform. Secretary Kerry has uh, always been a hero to people of my generation, which is the same generation as his. As a spokesman for the Vietnam Veterans Against the War in 1971, he played a major role in forcing the U.S. government to bring an end to that war. In his service in the U.S. Senate from 1984 to 2013, he, among many other things, on the Foreign Relations Committee, as he recounted, worked together with Senator John McCain uh, to achieve American reconciliation with Vietnam, which, is, which we see uh, in, in such an important way in the life of our own institute and in the, uh, those who have been uh, supporters of this gala, among uh, many other ways in which the U.S.-Vietnam relationship is healthy and important. And as he recounted, during a time when U.S.-China relations have been in tremendous difficulty, he has kept the U.S.-China relationship alive around a very, the most important and pressing issue, existential issue, as he says, which requires the cooperation of these two great powers, climate change. <clears throat> For those of us like myself who have watched Secretary Kerry's career through the entire length of it, I think he is the best defense against certain people who are bad-mouthing those who are in their 80s. We are delighted to be able to honor John Kerry for his service to our country and to the uh, agenda of American relations with Asia. Please come up to the podium. And Extremely, I had no idea I was receiving an award tonight. So <laughs> this is dessert. Thank you very, very much. Well, Secretary Kerry was, you know, this program is very intensely scheduled. Better stay up here because we're going to have a student awardee. And uh, on the program, he was allocated two to three minutes, but he didn't use it. So I'm going to 
No, I'm not going to. I'm going to introduce the student uh, honoree. The Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Student Award for Excellence in honor of John Kerry is awarded to Tsai Xia Mao. So uh, Tsai Xia should come up to the, you're there? Tsai, Tsai Xia Mao is a PhD student in our School of, Ur uh, of Urban Planning and Architecture in the field of urban planning. Her dissertation explores techno-politics of how the Indonesian state uses foreign capital from China and Japan to support their large-scale infrastructure ambitions. Prior to starting her PhD, she worked extensively in environmental policy making, including at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategy and the United Nations Center for Regional Development. Congratulations. Now we're Good evening. My name is Tony Bowie. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. I'm a filmmaker and artist in residence at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. I'd like to tell you a story. This is a story about a journey, not of miles, but of leadership and vision. It is my distinct honor to introduce the central figure of our story, Mr. Dominic Ng, whose extraordinary journey and achievements deeply resonate with the values and aspirations of the Weatherhead Institute. Dominic has made vast contributions as a bridge builder in finance, international relations, arts, social causes, and Asian and Asian American representation. But every great tale has a beginning, and our tale begins in 1977, where a young, aspiring student leaves Hong Kong to embark on an American adventure. At the University of Houston, he became a pioneer as the first academic tutor to student athletes, a role that led the universi university to later dedicate the Academic Center for Excellence in his honor. After graduation, he traveled west again from Texas to California, where he connected Asians and Asian Americans through business a role that would lead him to become the CEO of East West Bank. East West Bank opened its very first branch in Los Angeles Chinatown, connecting Chinese Americans overlooked by mainstream banks with the resources they needed to grow and thrive. Under Dominic's helm, East West transformed from a modest local bank into a global powerhouse with over 70 billion in assets. His leadership not only propelled East West to the forefront of the financial world, but also established it as a vital bridge connecting not just economies, but cultures and communities across the U.S. and Asia. Dominic's impact also extends to international affairs as the chair of the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Business Advisory Council, where he fostered greater collaboration and understanding in the region. Dominic's dedication to philanthropy and community service is evident in his role as trustee of the University of Southern California and the Academy Museum of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences as well as in his raising a record 66 million for the United Way of Greater Los Angeles as its first Asian American campaign chair. Moreover, as a fervent supporter of the arts and social justice, Dominic has contributed significantly to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Getty, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and finance, ground, finance groundbreaking films like Crazy Rich Asians and Everything Everywhere All at Once that celebrate and explore Asian and Asian American experiences. His dedication to the arts underscores his commitment to building a more equitable and inclusive society. As we gather to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, which embodies the spirit of, bridge, of bridging cultures and communities, it is fitting that we honor a man who has devoted his life to building these very bridges. His story is not just one of personal success, but of connecting worlds, fostering understanding, and promoting social good that truly embodies the spirit of this prestigious institution. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming and honoring Mr. Dominic Ng. Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, it's great to have a filmmaker to make an introduction of me. So I'm trying to figure out what I can embellish further but I'm no Secretary Kerry, so I wouldn't have those great story about the former presidents, about uh, the size of the girth and et cetera. <laughs> I'm just a 
immigrant from Hong Kong. You know, I didn't know how to drive a boat. I didn't know how to shoot. <laughs> so from the standpoint of uh, who I am, uh, one thing I do feel honored to be here tonight uh, to learn about the Weatherhead East Asia Institute and also celebrate your 75 years anniversary. I thought I was coming here for the 75th time, you know, as one of these honorees. I have no idea this is an inaugural gala dinner. So again, uh, well, East West Bank could have been 75 years old uh, today, but instead we just celebrate our 50 year anniversary uh, just last year. Thank you. The reason is 50 instead of 75. In fact, the founders of East West Bank started right in the beginning of the 50s. And six of the Chinese Americans, uh, business leaders, lawyers, architects, etc., in Chinatown, got together and they recognized that the new immigrants from Asia weren't able to get banking services from financial institutions. So they said, why don't we start a bank and focus on helping our immigrant population, help them to survive, help them to excel, and help them to get credits? That's how they decided it would be a good cause to form East-West Federal Savings and Loan. But for 20 years, they've been applying and applying and applying for the uh, license to open a savings loan. They kept getting rejected year after year. Until one day, one of the founders uh, suddenly got a light bulb on his head. He said, why don't I get two neighbors to join us? One is a restaurant owner from a restaurant in, near Chinatown called Little Joe, which is an Italian restaurant. And John Nuccio, who's of Italian descent, who decided to help his friends in Chinatown and be one of the founders. And F. Chao Chen, the chairman said that, I need two Caucasian, so give me another one. So he said that, okay, let me find my best friend, Chris Pacino, who's a Sicilian, a uh, sausage maker in a factory right next to Chinatown. Let's get two of them together and we'll try our luck. Surprisingly, got approved. That's how East West Bank started in 1973 instead of 1949. So clearly, the climate was very different back then versus today. But when I took over as a professional hired gun, uh, as a CEO of East West Bank back in the early 90s, I thought that, well, the environment's no longer the same. We ought to do more. East West Bank could do more for our customers. We shouldn't just took care of our customer and in the Chinese community, we should help these immigrants to reach further. We should help our customers to fully participate in all aspects of life in American society. If East West Bank is doing our job to really help, not just the financial needs, to help our immigrants, customers, to not just survive, but to excel, we ought to help them to fully participate in American society. So that's why I thought that it would be a good idea to make East West Bank the financial bridge between the East and the West, helping the immigrants to reach further to American society, helping American business to also identify opportunities throughout Asia and so forth. We started doing that for just import export business, real estate, etc. But as we continue to do really well financially at East West Bank, we're able to get beyond just a financial bridge. 
We became a cultural bridge, community bridge, global bridge today. And we had a lot more fun as a banker. We're not just focusing on the traditional uh, same old mom and pop business. We were able to branch out. We started getting into technology business, life science, clean energy, entertainment, art. And we enter into multiple different type of opportunities. As Tony talked about earlier, we we're fortunate to finance films like Crazy Rich Asian or Everything Everywhere All at Once. But before we get to do that, we have to make enough money in the entertainment business so that we can take some risk. So obviously, we were involved with blockbuster movies like Hunger Game or Oscar-nominated films like Silver Lining Playbook, Django Unchained. And we also actively financing films like TV shows like Orange is the New Black and Paramount uh, TV show Yellowstone. See the connection between LBGTQ and cowboys in Montana. So, but we have a lot of fun doing that. But it was really exciting to be at East West Bank, and I've been spending almost over 30 years now, continue to grow this organization because we had a great mission. I had great partners with all my colleagues at East West Bank, and I have incredible customers, always not just bank with us, but keep sending us more referrals. That all helps. But today, as we enter into 2024, an election coming, we can hear from the uh, TV shows and all over the newspapers that, you know, this political rhetorics of anti-China, which talked about competition, rivalry between U.S. and China. And that had a lot of what I call spilled over effect to the Asian Americans in the United States. Because a lot of China haters don't even know the difference between Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipino, or Thai. So as we see these political rhetorics uh, continue to escalate about going against China and so forth, I think all of us are clearly collateral damage if we do not have institution to step up and continue to help people to understand the cultural difference, to understand the difference between the country, to also further engage in ideas about constructive relationship. So we at East West Bank will journey on. With or without me in the future, there will be my colleagues who will continue to focus on being that bridge between the East and West. And I hope that Weatherhead East Institute will take the lead and all of us will follow. Follow your lead. And together, we'll find, hopefully, a constructive way to help bridge the East and the West. And after all, it's all about world peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. The Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Student Award for Excellence in honor of Mr. Dominic Ng is awarded to Caitlin Howe. Caitlin Howe is an MA student at the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Her research focuses on transnational, translingual, and grassroots media practices of overseas Chinese communities in the US in relation to Sinophone media networks in, in the Asia Pacific. For her master's thesis, Howe was studying the the mass media consumption of female workers in the Chinese immigrant-run garment industry in the U.S. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Ms. Caitlin Howe. Good evening. I am Sheila Coronel. I am a professor at the Columbia Journalism School. I am a friend and supporter of the, of the Weatherhead East Asia Institute a big admirer of Hang, and a friend of Hang. 
I am tasked to introduce someone who needs no introduction, but as Secretary Kerry said, everyone needs an introduction. She does not have the girth of William Howard Taft, but there is a connection. Go William Howard Taft was Governor General of the Philippines in the early 1900s, and our honoree comes from the Philippines. Her name is Maria Ressa, and she's the co-winner of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. And my fellow Filipina. Along with Dmitry Muratov, Maria was recognized for her efforts to safeguard freedom of expression. The Nobel Committee believes, as I am sure most of you here do, that without free expression, neither a democracy nor a just and lasting peace are possible. Maria is a veteran journalist with stints as CNN bureau chief in Manila and Jakarta, and as an executive of the Philippines' largest TV network. In 2012, she co-founded the new site Rappler in Manila. Fearless and spunky, Rappler uses the web and social media to reach out to younger audiences. When the populist Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, was elected in 2016, Rappler exposed the horrific excesses of his war on drugs, the thousands killed in that brutal war, and the tactics that Duterte used to flood the information space with lies and disinformation. Maria has been sued multiple times, accused of among others, evading taxes, violating a law that bans foreign media ownership, and something called cyber libel. She has been jailed, relentlessly trolled, and been at the receiving end of rape and death threats. Her courage and her determination to hold the line are an inspiration to many throughout Asia who are held in thrall by strong men and populist leaders who have demonized the press as elitist purveyors of fake news. Maria is currently in Colombia as a Carnegie Distinguished Fellow at Colombia's newly launched Institute of Global Politics, where she leads projects related to artificial intelligence and democracy. Later this year, she will join the faculty of Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs as a professor of professional practice. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Maria Ressa. Thank you. You know, every time I get convicted, uh, Sheila writes something for The Atlantic that shows how ridiculous the conviction is. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and my gosh, happy 75th anniversary to Weatherhead. <laughs> big tech, big tech by design and for profit has shattered the public sphere sending us all scurrying down our own individual rabbit holes, personalized for each of us, for what we want, where the tech fuels our addictive impulses for not just what we want, but our anger, our fear, our hate. And that has not been good for us as people and for society. I come from Southeast Asia, from the Philippines, where we have been ahead of the curve, right? In terms of information operations, information warfare, where the weaponization of social media is followed by the weaponization of the law. Journalists were on the front lines. I had 11 criminal charges. 11 of them. I never realized I would get arrested multiple times. Um, I began thinking I needed to do a workflow for getting arrested. Um, and in order to continue doing my job, I, I, we had to be okay with spending the rest of my life in jail. 
Of those criminal charges, all but two are now gone. We held the line, and there is time after. You can win by doing the right thing, because do... <laughs> because I think what the Nobel proved is that doing the right thing is the right thing, right? Um, here's the thing. In 2016, I, rem I remember standing in Silicon Valley telling, I, I was in a Google event, that what was happening to us in the Philippines is coming for you. And it did. Silicon Valley since came home to roost on January 6. For years now, I've said that 2024 is the tipping point for journalism. We must survive this time period, Jelani, wherever you are, right? It's a tipping point for journalism, and it is a tipping point for democracies all around the world. Which means that all of you here must do something more. More than 50 countries are going to the polls, but the biggest question, of course, is, if the platforms that connect us are tearing us apart, if the platforms that connect us by design are spreading lies laced with anger and hate faster than facts, when journalists do not have any defense, how can you have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts? Okay, but because this is a night of celebration, <laughs> um, let me just jump to the solution. There is a solution, we've shown you some of it. The book I wrote, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, was, uh, was cathartic to write. Um, here's the solution. I flew in yesterday before dawn from Manila, and I leave tomorrow at 6 a.m. Being here in person, seeing you, <laughs> Renewing, reigniting old friendships and relationships. That, you heard from John Kerry, that is how we get things done at the speed of trust. We must get up now because so much is at stake. So what I did today here at SIPA, I met my partners at the Innovation Lab at the Institute of Global Politics and my new wonderful RAs the real connections that we make tonight, everywhere we go, what we do with them at this moment of creative destruction. This is it. That is how we shape the world we want, better, I hope, than what we are living through today. Thank you, Weatherhead. Let's get up and do this. <laughs> now I'm pleased to announce the Weatherhead East Asia Institute 75th Student Award for Excellence in Honor of Maria Ressa is awarded to Tendor Dorji. Tendor is a PhD student in the Department of Political Science. His dissertation titled Religious Roots to Conflict Migration, Buddhism, Nationalism, and Radicalization in the Sino-Tibetan Conflict studies civil resistance and the ambiguous role of religion in ethnic conflict. Born and raised as a Tibetan refugee in India, Dorji has worked as a campaigner and grassroots organizer for human rights and has testified before the U.S. Congress. Tendor. Good evening. My name is Merit Jano. I'm the Dean Emerita and ongoing professor uh, at SIPA and Columbia Law School. It's my tremendous pleasure to be part of this evening's celebration of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. We all have a Weatherhead story or two. Let me briefly mention mine. Um, I'm a graduate of Columbia Law School, but I came to Columbia Law with a background in Japan and China, and Weatherhead was part of the draw of Columbia. And many years later, when I came out of private practice and government service, um, having uh, served as a trade negotiator responsible for Japan and China. It was Weatherhead that offered me a one-year cooling off period in 1994, and that started my professional affiliation uh, with Columbia and SIPA and the law school and Weatherhead. 
for which I am forever grateful. And so many here have wonderful Weatherhead stories. It is, as President Shafiq said, an incredible hub of interdisciplinary scholarship and engagement on Asia. Andy Nathan told me years ago that um, Columbia was one of the very first great universities to mainstream study of China uh, as part of great civilizations. And I know it's had an unwavering focus on Japan across so many fields. And in fact, no other great American university has been more recognized, our faculty, for our expertise on Japan and recognized through uh, the Emperor's Award, which is given to individuals for their achievements and service to Japan, including this year with the recognition of the contributions of Professor David Weinstein, who may be with us tonight and which makes us very proud. I also want to acknowledge Jerry Curtis, who couldn't be with us tonight, who was a former director of Weatherhead, um, a great political scientist, and part of Weatherhead for 60 of its 75 years, and the great historian Carol Gluck, uh, who I know is also with us uh, tonight. And there are so many others uh, who I know are here and I just wanted uh, to acknowledge. But the study of Japan and China is also, uh, we have great scholars on Korea and Southeast Asia. And under Heng's extraordinary leadership, I am fully expecting that we will be an absolute leading hub of scholarship on Vietnam. So let us thank Hung again tonight. So it's my special privilege uh, to say a word of introduction and recognize Haruhiko Kuroda. You know, his record has been really recognized as having been one of monumental achievements. He was picked by former Prime Minister Abe in 2013 to pull Japan out of deflation with bold monetary easing as part of Abenomics. And when he stepped down in April 23, after two five-year terms, I think there's so much to say about that record and his policies continue to be felt. He was a pioneer as central bank governor in many respects. For example, in taking interest rates into negative territory, he was responsible for significantly expanding the Bank of Japan's asset purchase program in particular, the BOJ introduced a program of yield curve control, not a subject you've heard earlier tonight, <laughs> in which the Bank of Japan committed to keep long-term interest rates low uh, by purchasing sufficient and very large quantities of Japanese bonds. Basically, he's recognized for taking steps that help pull Japan's economy of three decades of three lost decades, it's often said, uh, the period following Japan's asset bubble bursting when ja Japan went in and out of deflation and for a very long period from, 20, from 1992 to 2013, inflation barely crossed 1% and Japan experienced price declines in 11 of those years. Now looking at that history at this moment when central banks around the world are contending with inflation, it's also important to see how devastating can be the effects of a deflationary economy. He helped break that cycle and he and the late Prime Minister Abe are said to have breathed economic optimism into the Japanese psyche. Well, he did that after being uh, president of the Asian Development Bank, and also Vice Minister of International Finance, the pinnacle of a career service in the Ministry of Finance. We are really fortunate and delighted to have Governor Kuroda with us at Columbia this spring. And he is actually generously teaching two courses, uh, one on the future of monetary policy and a second on innovation in international monetary system. He'll be part of our activities at Weatherhead and across the university. To share a few remarks from Governor Kuroda, who unfortunately couldn't be with us, it's really especially fitting to hear from Professor Takatoshi Ito, who is without question one of Japan's most distinguished monetary economists, former dean of Tokyo University, former deputy 
Vice Minister of Finance. And we are very fortunate to have Professor Ito as a professor at SIPA, a member of Weatherhead, and director of the Program on Public Pension Funds and Sovereign Funds at the Center on Japanese Economy and Business at Columbia Business School. With that, Professor Ito. Thank, uh, thank you, Merit. And I'm very much honored to uh, deliver uh, former Governor Kuroda's uh, speech. Uh, he's my uh, uh, best uh, personal and uh, professional friend. Okay, this is uh, his words. <clears throat> so good evening, uh, Professor Jeno. Thank you for the kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be invited as an honorary uh, by the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and to be here at Columbia University. I join you tonight after a long public service career navigating Japan's uh, domestic economy and international uh, financial concerns and also Asian economic development. During this time, I witnessed various important moments uh, that revealed the shifting balance of power uh, among the world economies and the growing significance of Asian countries and markets on the world stage. In particular, the Asian financial crisis in 1987 and 98, which uh, fell during my tenure as uh, Director General of the International Finance Bureau, Minister of Finance, highlighted this trend and importance of multilateral cooperation between Asian countries. Although some Asian countries suffered sudden capital outflows, currency crisis, and needed assistance from the International Monetary Fund, they recovered very quickly. They adopted measures that would make their economies and the financial markets robust. During my tenure as president of the Asian Development Bank, I saw many low and middle income Asian countries start to grow fast, and the East Asian region deepened the economic cooperation and integration. In 2013, I was appointed as governor of the Bank of Japan. The task was to lift the Japanese economy from long stagnation and deflation. We had to invent several unconventional monetary policy tools because such a long stagnation and deflation was unprecedented in the post-war history of advanced countries. Fortunately, a strong easing policy, which we called quantitative, quantitative and qualitative easing, or QQE for short, put an end to deflation. After I resigned as governor last year, Columbia University was the first place to visit and give a talk. By 2010, China overtook Japan as the second largest economy in the world. China has become the largest trading partner for Korea and Japan. This has enormous impacts on not only the region, but also the world at large. The relationship between the communist China and the democratic market economies of Korea and Japan has not, all, not always been easy. Still, I hope the cordial relationship between the three East Asian countries can be maintained and strengthened through not only government level interactions, but also people level interactions. It is in this way that institutions like the Weatherhead East Asian Institute have a tremendous impact. Through its support for the study of not only practical applications of business and economic theory, but also cross discipline topics of history, culture, and politics. This institute is doing critical work to educate and support research 
that will enhance understandings of the countries of the region. Columbia University has a strong history of support for scholarship on Japanese policy and economics. Doubtless, there are some future policymakers in this room as I speak. I expect to see future generations equipped with the tools necessary to create a brighter future for us all. Thank you very much, and congratulations for Weather Head. Well, thank you. It's, it's now my honor to extend the Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Student Award for Excellence in honor of Haruhiko Kuroda uh, to Tsui Jing Tsai. Now, Tsui Jing Tsai is a PhD student in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literature, and his dissertation is called Between Wasteland and Wilderness, Rubber Nature and the Making of Tropical China, 1945 to 1998. It brings together the interdisciplinary fields of environmental humanities, borderland studies, and the history of science and technology to examine state-driven developments and sustainability in southern Yunnan. Unfortunately, Sui Xin is unable to join us because he's actually on a research trip in China at this moment. But I think he's watching us uh, uh, as it is live streamed, so please put your hands together for his extraordinary work. I told you I'd be back as your MC. All right. So our next honoree, Mr. Yuzaboro Mogi, is the honorary CEO and chairman of the board of directors of Kikoman Corporation. He's played a pivotal role in the corporation's global success and its impact extends beyond the corporate world. Mr. Mogi, who joined the company in 1958, has been instrumental in fostering international relations, serving as chairman of various organizations, including the Japan Midwest US Association and the Japan Productivity Center. His numerous accolades, such as the Medal with Blue Ribbon of Japan and the Order of Orange Nassau of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, attest to his significant contributions. Mr. Mogi is also a distinguished alumnus of Columbia Business School. He attended there 60 years ago. I think he was the very first Japanese student at the business school. Unfortunately, unforeseen circumstances prevent Mr. Mogi from joining us in person tonight. Nevertheless, his gracious letter to our gala guests, included in the program book, uh, reflects his enduring commitment to excellence and leadership. I encourage you all to read it closely um, sometime through the course of the evening. And you know, for someone who wished that they had Kikuman soy sauce at the dinner table right now, I thank you, Mr. Mogi. <laughs> So the Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Student Award for Excellence in Honor of Yuzabori Mogi is awarded to Sam Angel. <laughs> Sam, where are you? Sam is technically called my shadow tonight. He's taken many courses with me, um, and I'm going to miss Sam when he goes off next year um, to Washington, D.C. Right, Sam? Okay. Sam Angel is a student in the Master of Arts in Regional Studies East Asia program and a graduate of Columbia College. His master's thesis, Paper Tigers and Brotherly Comrades, Chinese Media and the Vietnam War, argues for the mobilizing ability of Chinese propaganda during the Vietnam War and highlights how Chinese state-sponsored media helped shape the notion of the global Cold War. When he's not writing master's thesis, I think he works out and is a bodybuilder, right, Sam? Has to be. All right, Sam, please join me in applauding Sam on his great success. Hello. Welcome to the 75th anniversary, our first gala. We're so happy to have you share this with us. My name is Carol Gluck. Uh, I am a historian of Japan. And I first came to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute in 1968 as a first year graduate student, and I've been here ever since. I don't know how, I can't do the math, but it's a full percentage of the 75 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have participated in and benefited from this extraordinary community of scholars and students and friends and New York and Asian, uh, companions in this journey, uh, all of whom make 
and have made and continue to make the Institute the dynamic, meaningful, and inspiring place that it is. I think you have heard tonight how often people are inspired by their place here. I'm going to just speak for a moment because some of my colleagues have a more personally and say that the, the East Asian Institute is, an, is the home for anybody associated with East Asia across the university. Over the years, that's meant people like chemists or composers. It's not simply people who study East Asia. It's a very capacious uh, community and everybody has benefited from speaking and working with people from very different disciplines, interests, uh, regions, countries. It's a very unusual place. And, and we have generations of students who will tell you that this was their home. And, and tonight I had the wonderful, wonderful fortune of having former students from the 1970s, there you Cynthia, and from later on come to me and talk about these years here. So I just wanted to say that I love Columbia, but there really is nothing like the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. And the last thing I want to say personally is that I agree very much with Secretary Kerry and with Maria Ressa that Asia is more important than it ever was and that we need to work at making things happen in the real world, that we, this is no time to retreat. And the Institute has always been connected. This is no time to retreat, to remain connected and to take the challenges, the challenges on climate, the challenges on democracy, the challenges on, on, on polarization. We have an opportunity, and I, I, this may sound arrogant, but the Institute is the kind of place that can do this, oddly enough, partly because it's not built like other parts of the university or other parts of the corporate government or nonprofit sector. So we actually stand on the shoulders of giants. The beginnings of the Institute were just replete with incredible people. We now are led by Heng and others who are in just as incredible. We are changing, we are expanding, we have a challenge. And finally on the Institute, personally I'd like to say that I have enormous faith in the future in the form of our students. Now you've seen tonight some of them who are the honorees, but this generation of students, whether they're in the masters or the undergraduate or the PhD programs, are really a hope for the future. They understand the challenges, they are not passive, and I think they will do us proud. So forgive me for that, but this is my Ah, my celebration, personal, of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to do that. I just had to do that. I it wasn't planned to do that. Thank you. So let me do what I was supposed to do, <laughs> which was I'm delighted to do what I'm supposed to do, which is to introduce our next honoree, who is Min Jin Lee. Now, I think many of you know her as the writer of two path-breaking novels about the Korean diaspora. Free Food for Thought was her first book, mainly about Koreans in America, and then the novel that I think many of you know, and if you don't know it, it's time to read it, and that's Pachinko, which is a great and moving saga of several generations of a Korean family throughout their lives, met much of it spent in Japan, across most of the 20th century. I'm a historian. When I read Min Jin Lee's work, it feels as if she has inhaled history through an enormous amount of research, which is clear, and then she has transformed that history that she's inhaled into human stories of ordinary people who both make history and suffer it. The very first line of Pachinko 
this novel, is history has failed us, but no matter. You will read no better account of the hardship, the discrimination, and the determination of Koreans who lived in Japan, still live in Japan, under very difficult social and uh, cultural, let's call them, conditions. Her new novel, which she is working on now, is called America Hagwon, which I think means America Academy, the kind of tutoring academy that you do for, for, for pupils, for students. I think promises to do something similar for Koreans' view of the importance and dedication to education, and that will take, I think, her characters across several countries, Australia included, the United States. So Min Jin Lee writes with a grace and, a, and an unflinching honesty. These are very honest books. And also with something that George Eliot once called sympathetic imagination, which, which she thought was the highest kinds of human relation to, an, to another human being. She writes with a sympathetic imagination about Asians in the world, Asians in the world yesterday, Asians in the world today, and I have faith, Asians in the world tomorrow. So I would like you all to welcome Min Jin Lee as our 75th anniversary honoree. Everybody's always surprised at how tall I am. Um, it was not always a good thing when I was younger. Thank you so much, Carol. She is the original gangster. And I'm so, so honored to be in conversation with Carol and also just to be in this room today, tonight. Um, because I trained in history, her words feel like a blessing to me. So I'm deeply moved by what she said. And gosh, I've thought so much about tonight. I was seven years old when I immigrated to Queens, New York. I'm from here. And it's fair to say that I was a very odd child. A psychologist, I've actually talked to several, would diagnose me as neurodiverse. And I think I still am. And for a very long time, is it still on? Okay. For a very long time, I could not speak with my peers. I could not read the room. And I didn't understand what in the world my teachers wanted from me until I went to the Bronx High School of Science, where I was surrounded by enough children who were uncomfortable with the world. And our remarkable teachers understood how to teach those of us who were sufficiently bright, but perhaps socially delayed. There should be no pity for me during that time of not being socially accepted because I found books. And whenever I had a wish, a question, or a problem, I knew there was consolation to be discovered in the experience of reading. I learned about the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia many years before I ever entered its doors. I didn't know you had doors, which I eventually did enter in 2017 briefly. However, well before 2017, I learned about the Weatherhead Institute because I read your publications of anthropology, art history, economics, education, religion, film, history, and literature in translation and sociology relating to Asia. One book that made an incredible impression on me was the novel, 
Who Ate Up All the Shinga by Pak Wanzha. Some of you here would know this book, which was translated, and I want to mention the translators here, by Yu Yangnan and Stephen Epstein, which Weatherhead published in 2009, which was 15 years ago. In the novel, the young protagonist says this, quote, I thought that no matter how many hills and brooks you crossed, the whole world was Korea, and everyone in it was Korean. I thought that no matter how many hills and brooks you crossed, the whole world was Korea, and everyone in it was Korean. To my mind, her words made perfect sense to me. If you were a child who did not travel and could not know any more than what you could see right in front of you. The quotation serves as one of my three epigraphs of my second novel because I wanted to telegraph the shock of my character, Sanja, an illiterate, pregnant Korean teenager who was born and raised in a remote island of Yangdo, Busan, who travels all the way to Osaka, Japan, which must have, in her mind, seemed to her impossibly modern and urban, thereby challenging the very foundation of her worldview. I put that quotation in my novel because I am in conversation with that writer who died in 2011, which Weatherhead Institute translated and published. I continue to read with great interest the works of the scholars associated with Weatherhead East Asian Institute because it is a premier, premier space for the development of new knowledge of Asia. Your publications and the work of the scholars that you have supported have allowed me, once a young reader, and now a more mature reader, to envision my creative wishes, to seek the answers to my most persistent questions, and to begin to approach the problems that I feel in my heart about why things are the way they are. I am a novelist who writes principally about the Koreas, Koreans, diasporic Koreans, elsewhere, Asia, and how Asia and the West relate to each other. And that means that I dwell in your scholarship. I have been thinking so much about what it is that you and I do together. And I think it is akin to fantastic space travel. When I want to understand a region and a people of a specific era, I feel compelled very strongly to visit, but it feels impossible to journey to yesterday. However, reading an article or a book supported or published by a place like the Weatherhead Institute, exploring that geographic reality and time, I'm able to enter that sturdy time machine that the writer has built and visit and dream in your rich world. I write novels very inefficiently. Ask my publisher. <laughs> to write novels, I read academic research. <laughs> I conduct personal interviews with thousands of people. 
I do so much field work that I spend through all of my fellowships rather rapidly. And I could not work well without your exquisitely wrought time machines, which allow all readers at any level to travel, explore, question, and discover new ways of seeing. I am always grateful to my fellow writers, but I wanted to be here tonight, not just because I'm being honored so graciously by an organization that I so admire, but principally because I knew that this tonight would be the ideal opportunity to thank the thinkers and the writers in this room and every person who has supported a brave scholar who built these valuable time machines, which allow each and every kind of mind to travel to humanity's yesterdays. So we can imagine, struggle, and build a far, far better tomorrow for all of us. I thank you. And I wish Weatherhead a very happy birthday. Oh, I love the idea of time travel, both, both in the past and the future. It's, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, I am now honored to present the Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Student Award in honor of Min Jin Lee to Isabella Maganda Garcia Bernstein. She is the only undergraduate among our awardees. She is a student at Barnard. She's a Filipino American uh, whose research focuses on cultural representations of the Philippines as an exotic tropical paradise based on Asian racial difference. This is a project that she's engaged in, that, that they're engaged in right now in, at the University of Barcelona in Spain. Uh, Isabella founded the Paglaban Filipino Literature Project, which is called for short the PPL Project, which is really super, the People Project. Isn't that nice? Uh, which, and that's a website that provides Filipino youth with a wealth of educational resources in various languages, English, Spanish, Tagalog, and others. So Isabella is a young, ambitious, smart, and engaged undergraduate student working on, if you like, the frontiers of the youth understanding, or the youth comprehension of their past, their present, and their future. Isabel is unable to join, as I said, working on the project that we are honoring them for, uh, but I would like us all to applaud this ambitious and exciting project and also the future of this student. Good evening. My name is Eugenia Lean. I'm a historian of modern China and a member of the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department in the Arts and Sciences. I'm currently serving as a Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs, and I mention this because when that job gets hard, and it gets very, very hard sometimes, I pine for my days at the Weatherhead uh, when I was the director. I was the director just prior to Hang, and I wanted to just do one slight correction. Andy, I'm not sure where Andy went, but Andy said that we haven't been celebrating our anniversaries. We have. We had a 70th uh, anniversary at the Forum, but I will have to say we've upgraded. We've upgraded with a director. Han Nguyen has been doing a fabulous job, and. Uh, I think Carol just mentioned sitting on the shoulders of the people's past, and she's really not just sitting on our shoulders, but surpassing us. Uh, and uh, what we've upgraded as well with is 
the gala. Uh, we had a buffet dinner last time. Uh, this is much more fancy. Uh, and then finally, we went from the forum, which is lovely, to Low Library, which is historic. Uh, I'm sort of waiting for the 80th. I'm not quite sure where we'll be at that point and where we have left to go, but hopefully only forwards. One thing I do want to mention briefly, uh, when I was uh, the director at the Weatherhead, we did start something known as the Asian Action Program. It's been mentioned a few times today. Uh, Tony Bui is the filmmaker who is our current Asian Action Fellow. Uh, and this is something that I'm really uh, excited about in terms of the new direction that Weatherhead is heading in. And this relates to some of the remarks by Senator Kerry, uh, by Secretary Kerry and, and, and others about the importance for action, for being engaged, for not just being uh, scholarly. Although I have to say I loved Min Jin Lee's uh, comments <laughs> because my book was on that list actually, so maybe you've read it. <laughs> Many of our books were on that list. So that was really fortifying to hear that uh, you know, our scholarship makes it to readers outside of the academy. Uh, and I think we're looking forward as well to ensure that all of our activities have impact with the real world. Um, and so Asian action is very, very important for us. And we feature uh, writers, we feature activists, and we feature artists. And it's in this, I wanted to mention this because this uh, will lead us to our next honoree. I'm extremely excited and honored to introduce one of tonight's honorees, Tsai Guoqiang. Uh, Tsai grew up in Quanzhou, Fujian, in China, where actually Tongxiang, my father, is also from that area. Um, his artistic journey took him first to Shanghai, the Shanghai Theater Academy, where he studied design, stage design, in the 1980s. He then went to Japan for nine years, where he furthered his education at the Plastic Art and Mixed Media Research Lab at Tsukuba University. Uh, and indeed, he's fluent in Japanese. And he's lived here in New York since 1995. Tsai is perhaps best known for his influential gunpowder, gunpowder paintings and pyrotechnic displays. His work spans painting, performance art, installations, and cutting edge technologies like virtual reality, blockchain, and artificial intelligence. The effects for the viewer when you're observing his art are simply amazing. Whether you are viewing his magnificent and spectacular pyrotechnic displays, where it looks as if he's painting the sky with fireworks, or the far more quiet but no less powerful paintings where he uses gunpowder to affect what looks like traditional Chinese ink on rice paper technique, or at times, shan shui hua, right? Uh, mountain water landscape uh, art. With an impressive 563 exhibitions and projects on five continents, Tsai is a recipient of prestigi prestigious awards such as the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale, the Hiroshima Art Prize, and the US Department of State Medal of Arts, among others. Notable achievements include directing visual effects and fireworks for the Beijing 2008 Summer and 2022 Winter Olympics, as well as historic solo exhibitions in renowned museums like the Met, the Guggenheim, the Palace Museum in Beijing, and dozens of others. Recent projects like the Blockchain Divin Divination Project, EET, and the Artificial, Artificial Intelligence Art Project, CAITM, trademark, all showcase his fearless engagement with new artistic mediums, but also with technology. Tonight, we celebrate Tsai Guoqiang for over three days, uh, three days, sorry, three decades of groundbreaking artistry across the West and Asia, challenging conventions and fostering deep dialogue between art and society. Please join me in welcoming this visionary artist to the stage. Wow, thank you, everyone. I've been waiting for so long. 
Thank you for waiting so late to hear me speak. I wrote it down so I can speak faster. I'm someone who's terrified of going back to school. But I feel quite at home coming back, uh, coming to Columbia today, because many of my staff over the years have been Columbia graduates. 包括现在为我翻译的令也是从哥伦比亚大学。你是先到我那边受苦了三年,再到哥伦比亚大学,现在已经在东亚研究所工作。That includes Lynn, me, who is interpreting right now, who spent three years fighting battles alongside Tsai at his studio before coming to Columbia and working now at the Weather Hardy Sajan Institute. 对。就像林教授说的，我是在中国东南的一个城市，一个古城，泉州出生，然后在上海受了教育，又在日本，呃，成长了八年到九年。Like Professor Lin said, uh, I was born in Quanzhou in the south of China, then received my education in Shanghai, and then worked for eight, almost nine years in Tokyo. So I can say that Chinese culture was the basis of my art, including my religion. So it's very fair to say that East Asian culture has formed the foundation of my work, um, including my methodology. That includes the concept of yin and yang from the I Ching, the principle that everything re that reaches an extreme always reverses in the opposite direction, the dialectic of destruction that leads to construction, and the doctrine of the mean that stretches harmony and inclusivity. So I use fire in art as well as the principle of yin and yang. The power of fire is in its inability to control and its evil. My use of gunpowder in art is also grounded in these beliefs. The lure of gunpowder lies in its uncontrollable and unpredictable nature, the element of chance. In striving to become a good painter, I find myself in a constant struggle between the desire to master and dictate the art form versus letting the gunpowder roam free and surrendering to a lack of control. So using fire as a medium, not only uses the power of fire to communicate, but also uses the power of nature and the world and the unseen world to communicate with people's various unpredictability. Using gunpowder as a medium is to engage in dialogue with the energy of gunpowder, but also with the energies coursing through nature, the cosmos, the unseen world, and the many uncertainties that we face in life. My life and art are more concerned with the wind and the wind and the wind from the big to 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 the big. In life, as well as in art, I care a lot about feng shui and the flow of qi. Uh, this encompasses everything, including every blade of grass, every human life, as well as imaginations of paradise. I believe in the unseen world. I believe that my late grandmother's soul is still present. If we are to draw from contemporary cosmology, she may even be present in the dark energy of the universe. 2015年我在家鄉海邊實現了爆破項目天梯,因為我奶奶我在全世界做各種作品,她都沒看到,所以我看到已經100歲了,回去給她做了一個500米高的天梯是在早晨升起來的。in 2015, I realized the explosion event Sky Ladder. It was just dedicated to my grandmother, who was turning 100, but had never been able to travel and see the works that I realized around the world. So I created this for her. It was a 500 meter high ladder made from fireworks that rose into the sky at dawn. So this is the 
在实现了一个月以后，我奶奶去世。This work which connected heaven and earth was created, and then a month later, my grandmother passed away. 我的家乡泉州离北京很远，天高皇帝远，几乎所有全世界的宗教在泉州都有，而且与本地的民间信仰融合一体。Chenzhou, my hometown, is very far from Beijing, and when you're far from the emperor, the sky's the limit. In Chenzhou, you can find just about every religion in the world coexisting peacefully with local folk beliefs. So my family's history and culture has been more diverse, open, and respectful of the diversity of people. And so, to me, the history and culture of my hometown represent comparative diversity, openness, freedom, and a respect for individuality. 一九八六年底，我来到日本，本来是向往国际化、现代化而来，却在日本回溯了中国古代的优秀文化。In late 1986, I moved to Japan. The move was meant to be a shift toward internationality and modernization. But while here, while there, I found myself revisiting the best of ancient Chinese culture. In Japan, I also actively from the outside world and outside perspective to think about the way that Chinese art can surpass the two Western perspectives. In the hopes of transcending the binary of East versus West in the contemporary art world, I thought a lot in Japan about approaching things from an extraterrestrial and cosmological perspective. So I did a series of outside-looking projects to show that outside viewers can see the problems of the outside world from an outside perspective. So I created a series of explosion events called Projects for Extraterrestrials, the premise of which was to treat extraterrestrials as the artwork's audience, but also to re-examine us Earthlings from an extraterrestrial point of view. In 1995, September 1995, I received a grant from the Asian Cultural Council's Japan-U.S. Artist Exchange Program and moved to New York with my wife and daughter, who are here with us tonight. Hey, 就是我太太女儿也来。从此，我不可避免地面对二十、二十、二十世纪、二十一世纪的东西方全球化和高科技发展对人类的问题。Since then, I've had to confront the problems that we all face in the 20th and 21st centuries, including globalization and the rapid development of technology. 我到美国做的第一件作品就是申请进入内华达的原子弹基地，用手持鞭炮的腰管炸出一朵蘑菇云。幽默的致敬美国的世纪，也致以二十世纪的当代艺术。The first thing I did after coming to the U.S. was apply to enter the Nevada nuclear test site, where I used a small firecracker tube to explode a miniature mushroom cloud. This was meant to be a humorous tribute to the 20th century, often known as the American century, but it was also a subversive questioning of 20th century art. 一九九六年起，我的作品更加的。更加多的因地制宜，虽然也包含了东方的方法论的实践，但更多以人类命运和社会政治为主题，呈现了我在西方文化水土里发展的变化，也让我更好的在地球上不同文化里耕种开花。Starting in 1996, my work grew more site-specific. While they still incorporate Eastern methodologies, they engage more with themes of human destiny and social politics, reflecting the changes that I myself have undergone living in the West. This has enabled me to work in many different cultures around the world. So my work in the five countries, including Ukraine, Belarus, and even in many parts of the Middle East, is about human-to-human interaction and a common cultural exchange of different cultures. I've realized projects in five continents. I've made art in Ukraine, Russia, and several countries in the Middle East. All of these collaborations have been about communication and exchange between individual people and mutual respect between cultures. My artistic goal, although not for political purposes, has the meaning of political use, including the use of fire. As I said in the Nobel Prize Ceremony speech, the creation of beautiful art Therefore, 
So the goal of my creative endeavors isn't exactly political. My work does carry political significance. Like I said in a speech at the 2019 Nobel Prize event, using explosives to create beauty rather than warfare and violence provides just a sliver of hope, I hope, for our shared human future. Eastern philosophy is very inclusive. It embraces the changing times as well as people's self-contradictions. And I, too, use my artwork to express self-contradiction and ambivalence, including oscillations between Eastern and Western cultures and between the political left and right. It's sometimes said that East Asians share a common cultural philosophy, the oneness of heaven and humanity. This refers to a spirit of mutual tolerance and harmony among individuals, as well as between humans in the natural world and humans in the greater cosmos. But if that's the case, then why haven't East Asian cultures contributed more to the happiness and balance of 21st century society and the global biosphere? Quite the opposite, it has even turned into a dangerous powder keg for the world. And when people wish to consider the possibility of whether traditional Eastern East Asian thought can shed light on the many challenges we face today, whether environmental or cultural. When people consider that, that is when the work being done at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute takes on a new historical significance and timeliness, and is also a reason why we look forward to the Institute's future work all the more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Weatherhead East Asian Institute 75th Anniversary Award for Excellence in honor of Mr. Tsai Guoqiang was awarded to Kanako Tajima. Kanako Tajima is a PhD student in the, in the Department of Art History and Archaeology. Her dissertation, titled Between Tokyo, California, and New York, Feminist Transnational Art Practice by Women Artists from Japan in the 1970s to the 1980s examines the neglected yet intimate link between feminist activism and Japanese art practice, and aims to develop a transnational and non-Eurocentric art history framework. I'm very happy to welcome Kanako Tajima to the stage. It was a fun four hours, but I have to let you go. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to help us celebrate our 75th anniversary.